This picture was taken when I was 28 years old. I was young, vulnerable, and extremely naive. I had no idea of the struggles and the challenges that I would face and how they would strengthen me in the years to come. If I could have written one piece of advice to my younger self back then, it would have been to hang on tight. Sometimes people hide the most pain in the most obvious of places, their smile. I remember when I took this picture. I was in New Orleans on a business trip. And although I'm smiling in the picture, on the inside, I was emotionally broken. I was temporarily trying to escape, escape from the confusion, the pain, and the embarrassment of a recent event with my boyfriend two months prior. May 12th, 2008 is a date that is etched in my head like a tattoo. It will not go away. It is a date that changed my life forever. It was the day after Mother's Day, and it was almost the last Mother's Day that I had to spend with my children. As usual, my boyfriend and I had had an argument on the phone. We had so many arguments that they literally ran together. I can't even remember what the argument was about. We'd have one or two good days followed by four or five bad days. It was a really vicious cycle, but it was our normal. This day, however, would prove to be different than most days. When he arrived home, he was on 10. He was still irate. He was pissed. He was cussing. He was fussing. And I remember going to the bedroom and slamming the door and locking it because I had had enough. Within 20 minutes of him arriving home, I would be laying at the bottom of the steps, beaten nearly to death, bloody, and hemorrhaging. The pictures that I'm going to share with you this evening are graphic, and you can look away if you must, but I hope you won't look away. I show these to you because not only do I think it's important to hear what domestic abuse is like and what it does to a person, I think it's important to also show you what it looks like. My children, my two daughters at the time, were ages seven and 18 months, and they watched in horror as he kicked the door in and later kicked me down the steps. He repeatedly began to kick me in my head until I was unconscious and hemorrhaging. These arguments that we had were common to our family, my immediate family. I hid them from everyone else, but my children and my parents were no stranger to the back and the forth that we went through. However, thankfully, my seven-year-old daughter trusted her instinct enough to know that this argument was not like the others. What I didn't know is soon after he had arrived home, she called my mother with fear and anxiety in her little voice, begging my mom not to hang up and to come and save her mommy. I'm so grateful that my mother also paid attention and she didn't shrug it off as just another argument. My parents rushed over to find what is to any parent the worst experience ever, to find your daughter nearly dead at the bottom of the steps. Believe it or not, I took him back almost immediately after that event. My parents were, they were so upset. They were disappointed. My children were confused. Nobody could understand how after such a vicious and almost deadly act, I could take him back. I made so many excuses for him. My mom later told me that she remembers sitting down with me 
and wanting to just try to get through to me. And she said, it was something she will never forget. When she looked at me in my eyes, she said there was nothing there. I was literally dead on the inside. I remember that exact encounter that my mom was talking about, because that's exactly how I felt. I felt dead on the inside. I couldn't explain why I took him back. I couldn't explain it to my family, and I really couldn't even explain it to myself. It was like an urge, like an addiction. Even though I knew that it could possibly kill me down the road and it wasn't good for me, I just couldn't let it go. These types of rationalizations that we make keep a victim bound. It keeps you from seeing the situation for what it truly is. He was a piss poor partner. However, he was a good provider. He was a good father. That's what I told myself anyway, more rationalizations. I wanted to give my children what my parents gave to me. And so to find a man that accepted my other two children as his own, that was golden to a single parent. I wanted to raise the daughter that we shared together with him. And more than anything, I wanted to be married. I wanted to prove to my family that I could get a relationship right for a change. My dad used to tell me all the time, you don't really want to be married. You're just in love with the idea of being married. You just want what everybody else has. You know, it's not uncommon for a woman to take an abusive partner back. On average, a woman will leave seven times before she leaves for good. And I was no stranger to the statistics. Many times I had left and I had come back. He would always find a way to manipulate the situation, make me feel bad sometimes. And I'd come back. I made so many excuses for him as to why he was depressed and he didn't have a job and, you know, why he was on edge and, I, and, and why I had to stay to help him through those things. But, you know, victims are not the only ones that make all of these rationalizations for abusers. Society does it as well. I think we all are a little guilty of trying to rationalize the things that we don't understand, abuse being one of them. We say things like, he was abused as a child, or he was drinking, or, you know, he has a temper, he can't help it. Or even worse, we blame the victim. And we say things like, well, she must like it. She doesn't leave. She stays for it. When I share my story with people, the look on their face goes from shock to a look of confusion as they are mentally trying to analyze the how and the why. Someone that once loved you and you share a child with could do something so awful. And it's almost like these rationalizations that they try to make, that somehow it's going to unlock a key that will explain his behavior. Although he had only been abusive physically that one time in 2008, as if that wasn't enough, he had been psychologically and emotionally manipulating the relationship for almost eight years. I literally didn't even know that there was such a thing as emotional abuse until I was out of the situation. You know, I've had many people ask me, well, if it was so bad, why didn't you just leave? It's not that easy. It's not like he was a random guy off the street that was you know, physically abusing me or talking to me like 
you know, I didn't deserve to be talked to. This was somebody that I loved. This was somebody that I had invested my time into. But at 34, I had enough. I began to look through all these rationalizations that I was making. I began to see through this fog that I had been in. And I ended the relationship. But what I didn't know is that a woman is in the most danger at the end of a relationship. A woman has a 70% chance of homicide at the very end. So although I had ended it, I had no idea what kind of danger I was in. December 6, 2013, he confronted me about cheating. And although we weren't in a relationship anymore, he was adamant that I had been cheating on him. As you can imagine, this argument escalated. And before I knew it, I began to be fearful because of what I had been through with him before. I paid attention to his body language. I paid attention to the tones in his voice when he told me that, bitch, you're going to die tonight. I'm going to kill you. The fear that ran through my body was one that I can't even explain. But the funny part was he said it in such a way that was so calm. It was eerie. I believed him. So as I attempted to walk away and get my youngest daughter, who was the only person home at the time, and leave. I couldn't get away quick enough. Before I knew it, I was on the ground, and he did everything he could to make good on that promise of killing me that day. He strangled me. He kicked me in my head multiple times. I remember he put his foot in my throat, and he went to twist it, and he said, I'm going to break your neck. It was almost like it was pissing him off that I wasn't dying. He kept trying. And every time he kept trying, I wasn't losing consciousness. I wasn't, I was well aware and alert. At one point, during all of this fighting and back and forth, I remember he was laying on top of me, strangling me from behind. It takes my breath away just to even still talk about it. Because, you know, like when you see movies where somebody is strangling somebody with all their might, that's what he was doing. He was putting every bit of his 220 pounds between my neck. And as he's strangling me, and I'm trying with every little breath that I have to rationalize with him and prove to him that I'm not cheating on you, I'm not with anybody, he didn't care. He strangled me harder. And you know people say when you get to the end of your rope or you're about to die, there's so many things that flash before your eyes. And it did. I thought about my seven-year-old daughter walking in that room and finding her mother face down. I thought about ruining my kid's Christmas. I thought about so many things in those few seconds that I felt like I was dying. My legs were going numb. I couldn't even feel my legs anymore. I got to the point that I wasn't going to rationalize with him anymore because it wasn't working. And so with the breath that I had left, I called on Jesus. And it may sound so cliche to some, but to others, I know you get it. Because when I called on him, he answered. I had just enough breath left to try and fight back. Not a lot, but I decided I'm not going to let him take me out like this. I'm going to fight back. And when I did that, I managed to wrestle my way so that I wasn't at least laying down vulnerable. He, uh, at one point, grabbed me by the top of my head, and he slung me from one end of the room to the other. And when he did, my head 
hit the sharp edge of the master bathroom door frame, and it split it all the way to the middle of my head. My guardian angel, I swear she looks like this sometimes. <laughs> because many times I have put her to work. No joke. The, uh, I was able to escape that day. But the one thing that I couldn't escape was the judicial process. I swear, it beat me up just as bad as he did. It was grueling. You would think from what those pictures look like, he would have been sent to jail and serving time in prison. No, no, it doesn't work that way. He didn't turn himself in until two weeks later. And when he did turn himself in, he got bond. So he was out and free for nearly two years. We went through 18 continuances, multiple hearing dates, before he was convicted of felonious assault and sentenced to prison six years last September. Abuse has so many levels and dynamics to it. It's more than black eyes and swollen lips. It's manipulation, it's narcissism, it's feeding on insecurities. Most people think it's, it's a random thing. Or like he said, he blacked out. No, don't be fooled. It is a process. This didn't happen overnight. It took time to groom me to get to this point. The sad part is, I nearly lost my life at the hands of somebody that was supposed to love me. But the very painful thing is that I didn't love myself enough to see that I was dying a little bit every day. It's been so life-changing that I don't want to say thank you, but I thank God for bringing me through this experience. I realized that I may have been battered, but I was not broken. I was made whole in those cracked and shattered areas of my life. God strengthened those things. It was the birthplace of my nonprofit organization, Battered Not Broken. It was established to help support, empower, and educate other women on the skills and tactics to avoid ever finding themselves in a dangerous, dysfunctional, harmful situation like I had found myself in. I try to teach other women, and men as well, because it doesn't just happen to women, but I try to teach people, when somebody shows you who they are, you got to believe them. Many times he had shown me exactly who he was. I think when we rationalize away all these red flags, we miss the message that our instincts and our higher power, God, is trying to send us. We have to stop allowing ourselves to have those blinders on. This situation has empowered me to learn more, not only about myself, but how I can help others now with this platform that I have and how I can help my children. The one thing, if I have any regrets in this situation, is that I allowed my children to live through this with me. And so this has made me want to learn more about behavior, about emotion. So I'm in my second year pursuing my degree in psychology. And in learning, about the brain and emotion and all of these things, nature and nurture. I can't go in and I can't change my children's biology that they have and some predisposed things that they're just going to be who they are. But what I can change is the nurture. I can change the environment. I can't go back and remove all the trauma that my children have endured. My children now are ages 20 and 14 and 9, and they still remember a lot of these things vividly. 
I can't go back and I can't change it. But what I can show them is that when you go through hardships and when you see things that are not right, you have to raise your hand, you have to make changes, you have to be conscious. The only thing, the only remedy for domestic abuse is consciousness. Consciousness of what it is, consciousness of what it looks like, consciousness of what it feels like emotionally and psychologically. I remember when about a week after the last assault had happened, my oldest daughter was scared to go home. And I remember telling her, we're gonna pick up these pieces and we're gonna keep living. He's taken enough and we won't allow that anymore. I was scared as hell. I was so afraid, but I could not allow my daughters to see that. I had to show them the strength that maybe I didn't even have, but it came over time. And so I represent the survivor. I represent the fighter that's in all of us. I show this and I do this for my daughters. I do this for our daughters to show them to never run back to what tried to break you, to never let a man or a circumstance hold you prisoner in your own mind, to keep fighting when you feel like you've been defeated, to unapologetically do what you need to do to survive. And above all else, never, ever put the key to your happiness in somebody else's pocket.